introduce the second keynote speaker. We also had him last year at the conference. Uh, he got his no, Master's of Computer Science from Georgia Institute of Technology, Atlanta, United States of America, and now he's a Chief Executive Officer uh, building the entire stack from scratch and scaled it to millions of users. Class Central is the most popular search engine for massive open online courses. Of course, he is the Chief Executive Officer of the Class Central. And also from April 2017 to current, uh, he's the columnist of the H Square, uh, sorry, H Search, uh, the writing thought pieces and uh, analysis about the MOOC space. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, may I probably present uh, Mr. Dawal Shah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Dawal. Uh, I would like to thank the TCU team for inviting me again. Uh, last year, I spoke about the evolution of MOOCs. And this year, I'll speak about uh, the, business, uh, the business side of MOOCs. But before I go ahead, let me tell you a bit about Class Central. I started Class Central almost seven years ago. Uh, it was a side project that I built for myself uh, to keep track of a few Stanford courses uh, that uh, were popping up. Later, these courses were being called, uh, started being called MOOCs, or Massive Open Online Courses. Uh, our goal at Class Central is to help learners find the best courses on any topic, wherever they exist. We try to aggregate as many MOOCs from as many universities and course providers from all over the world. And over time, uh, we have built an ecosystem around these courses. For example, we have something called the follow button for education. And with the follow button, you can follow a subject, like you can follow humanities, computer science, social science, or any, any of the subjects that we have. Or you can follow universities, and uh, you can follow course providers, and we will send you recommendations and updates based on your follows. Uh, this is how a course page on Class Center looks like. Uh, we collect a number of different uh, pieces of information, and we try to standardize it across different providers. We collect the course description, the syllabus, uh, the effort required, the duration of the course, uh, and other such details, and try to standardize it across different course providers. Uh, our users also can write reviews, so we also crowdsource reviews from our learners. And based on the data that we collect from all these uh, users, we publish a number of uh, uh, rankings. Uh, our rank we publish rankings on a monthly, annual, and all-time basis. Uh, this is a good way to uh, let users know of interesting courses, as well as market, uh, be good at marketing, uh, like bringing new audiences into the MOOC world. I consider Class Central to be in the business of educating people about online education. And the another way we do that is by writing about MOOCs. Our blog, MOOC Report, is the only MOOC industry-focused news and analysis publication. Uh, we get almost uh, 80, uh, every month 80,000 people read our blog. And this is how Class Central looks like in numbers. Our uh, users have written over 40,000 reviews. Uh, we have published more than 700 articles. A lot of my talk is, will actually be based on the articles that we have published on Class Central. Uh, we are almost approaching 1 million users, and the follow button that I talked about before has almost uh, 15 million follows. 
So that's about Class Central, and uh, this is how the agenda looks for the rest of the talk. I'll start by sure, telling you about the state of MOOC. Some of the slides you might have seen uh, in yesterday's keynote. Uh, then I'll talk about what changes MOOC providers have done, the four steps of monetization, to, uh, four steps they have done to achieve monetization. Then we'll go through a specific example of our Coursera, which is the largest MOOC provider in the world. And uh, after that, I'll summarize uh, the MOOC monetization model into six different pricing tiers. Then we'll quickly look through a few examples of certain universities and companies uh, and how much they are making. So where are MOOCs uh, in 2018? Uh, these, these numbers are based on analysis I did at the end of last year, so they're a bit outdated. Uh, but in 2017, uh, 23 million learners signed up for at least one MOOC. Uh, this is similar to the number of learners that signed up in 2016. So what it means is like the user growth is, is, has become flat, but the courses are being launched aggressively as ever. At the end of 2017, there's 9,400 courses. It's probably it's around 10, it's over 10,000 now. And more than 800 universities have created these courses. Around 40% of these courses are in the topic of uh, business and technology. Uh, these are the ones that are the most monetizable uh, in MOOCs, so that's why more, you will see more and more courses going in that direction. And here are the top five MOOC providers uh, around the world. Uh, Coursera, edX, Udacity are US-based MOOC providers. Uh, Coursera and Udacity were started by Stanford professors, while edX were, uh, were, is backed by MIT and Harvard. It's a nonprofit. Uh, they both, uh, they all, all three of them were started back in 2011 or uh, early 2012. FutureLearn is a UK-based provider, and it's a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Open University in U UK. And Shwetang is, is China's largest MOOC provider. It started a couple of years later than most of these MOOC providers, but it's catching up very quickly. And it's backed by Tsinghua University. So, so when MOOC started, uh, they had no clue about monetization. Uh, they just launched and they got a lot of users early on. They created more courses, but monetization was uh, a challenge and they didn't know. So over time, based on my observation, these are the four steps that MOOC providers have taken to monetize uh, the courses. They don't have to be de done in order. Uh, the first step is reducing the free tier. Originally in MOOCs, everything was free. The course videos, uh, assignments, and even uh, the certificate. Uh, but to monetize MOOCs, uh, they had to reduce the free tier. Uh, the policy might vary from course providers to provider, but all the major MOOC providers have taken back what was free in MOOCs. Uh, when MOOCs started, they were session-based. Uh, what that meant was they had a start date, end date, and they're offered once or twice a year based on university schedule or the professor's schedule. But that meant it was difficult to monetize the course online if it's only available three to four months a year. So MOOC providers have tweaked their model so that courses nowadays, once they're launched, they're generally run in a self-paced mode. So they're generally available throughout the year, and it increases monetization because there's more courses that users can sign up for. Uh, the next thing they did is focus on professional learners. Uh, the narrative originally around MOOCs was disruption of university, but now we know that 
I, we heard in uh, uh, yesterday's keynote too that the average age of uh, a MOOC learner is around 29. So what we now know is uh, it's not the university students, it's the people who are well beyond their university years are taking these courses for uh, professional and uh, career growth. And the fourth step is basically creating more credentials that these learners can use, uh, can uh, learn new skills, as well as use this to demonstrate, um, demonstrate that they have these skills to the future employers or even to their current employers to get a promotion, to um, you know, or just get a better, uh, uh, better appraisal, or even switch completely switch jobs. So in hindsight, these four steps might not look uh, uh, might look pretty obvious, uh, but the path to getting here wasn't easy. It required a lot of experimentation and a lot of missteps. So now we'll go through how Coursera, the world's largest MOOC provider, um, got to their monetization. So as I mentioned, Coursera, is a, they were started back in 2012. Um, they're now the world's largest MOOC provider. They have the most courses, the most students, and the most university partners. But this was the homepage of Coursera in 2012, and their original mission was to provide free online education to everyone, everywhere. And the first few monetization models they tried out actually tried to stay true to this mission. So one of the first things they did uh, was they, did a, uh, they attempted at being uh, headhunting, which basically meant university, uh, sorry, employers can uh, hire or potentially hire the top performers in Coursera courses. Uh, they even had uh, companies like Facebook and Twitter signed up for it. Uh, but actually, uh, this didn't work out and they shut it down quietly. Then in January 2013, uh, a year after they launched, they launched something called Verified Certificate. At this point, Coursera was still offering a free statement of accomplishment, uh, but Verified Certificate was a tier above this, where for, if you pay a fee, uh, they verified your identity. So you had to upload your driver's license, and every time you submit an assignment or a homework, they took a photo of you. And this seemed to be working. Uh, within nine months of launching, they made a total revenue of a million dollars and had sold 25,000 verified certificates. So, so Coursera went further down this path and launched a micro-credential called specialization. Uh, specialization basically is a sequence of courses and learners have to get a certificate for each of the course and then you earn a specialization certificate. And this also seemed to be working. Now, you know, it's, within a few months, they're making a million dollars a month. Uh, a year ago, they made their first million dollars and they're already do, uh, making a million dollars a month. So this was a sign that certificates and micro-credentials were part forward. So what does Coursera do? They stop offering free certificates. So this was one of the first signs as a student that maybe free education for everyone, everywhere is not possible, or it might not be in the future. Uh, so Coursera, to push learners towards their verified certificate, they started, they removed the free certificate tier. At the same time, uh, like this is the second step I said to increase availability. Uh, Coursera started rebuilding their technology to support self-paced courses. Uh, it was only, originally it was only limited to a few courses, and one of the things they did was the new, the, the new technology platform didn't support free certificates. 
And this is some data that uh, uh, the John Hopkins uh, University shared, uh, the professors of, uh, shared about their data science specialization. At that time, it was one of the most popular specialization in Coursera. And uh, they, it, it was a nine course specialization. It received 1.76 million signups and almost 72,000 uh, certificates were awarded. Uh, it says we're signature track here because that's what uh, Coursera called it back then. They called the verified certificates as signature track. Uh, they don't use this branding anymore. And the revenue they made uh, in just like three quarters of 2014 was $1.75 million. Another interesting number you can see here is how the completion rate goes up when somebody buys a certificate. It goes up from 10% to 85%. And, you know, and these numbers obviously, you know, seems like specializations and packaging courses into specialization is working. And now, so what Coursera does is like they want more of these specializations. Until this point, it was up to the universities uh, to launch these courses and uh, specializations. So Coursera decided to take control of this process. Now what they did was they, they made a list of specializations which they thought would monetize well. And then they asked their member universities to bid on it. The winning universities would get a $100,000 grant to create these specializations. And, uh, and the grant money would be recovered, recovered from this specialization revenues. Uh, in mid-2015, Coursera announced the IMBA. Uh, it was the f uh, their first MOOC-based online degree. They partnered with University of Illinois. The cost of this online degree is around 22,000, which is half of the campus degree. And the degree was built around six uh, Coursera specializations. You need to uh, get six Coursera specializations, and there's other work too to earn this uh, degree. Uh, so this was a, a very aggressive move that Coursera did in October 2015, uh, where they they pushed the assignments behind a paywall. Now, if you want to do access graded assignments. Uh, you also had to uh, buy a certificate. Uh, this wasn't well received along, uh, amongst learners, and there were a lot of online comments, but it didn't matter. Uh, the other change they made with, to their on-demand self-paced model is instead of going completely self-paced, Coursera tweaked uh, the scheduling so that now courses are automatically started every two weeks or four weeks. And instead of, and if you don't finish it within that period, uh, you're automatically moved to a next session. So it, it's not session-based, uh, and it's also not self-paced, but somewhere in the middle. And it seems to be something that uh, is working for the students as well as them. Uh, one of the experiments they tried in uh, early 2016 was a mentor-based, uh, mentor-guided courses, uh, where if you pay a bit of uh, extra, you get a mentor assigned to you. Um, this actually, they shut down the project. Uh, the, they didn't continue with the pilot. Uh, then in June of 2016, Coursera finally closed their old platform and they asked all their professors to move to the new on-demand platform that they had been building for almost a couple of years now. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of pro instructors didn't do that, and we've lost uh, hundreds of courses, were lost forever. Another experiment that Coursera tried was uh, paid-only courses. Uh, these courses were actually free before, and they're free now, but for the pilot, they made them completely paid. Uh, they, the, they didn't continue with that, but paid courses do exist in Coursera. Sometimes they call them professional certificate, 
and some of the Google uh, courses created by Google on Coursera are actually paid. Uh, Coursera, in August of 2016, Coursera announced Coursera for Business. Uh, this was them going after the lucrative corporate training market. Um, Coursera for Business is just the same Coursera content and certificate that employers can uh, be a bulk pay for their uh, employees. And in, they get some additional features like uh, progress tracking and analytics uh, on top of that. Then in October 2016, Coursera switched to a subscription model. Uh, before that, uh, you had to pay for each course separately. Or you paid a single price for each course separately. Uh, and for the specialization also, you paid a single price. But then Coursera switched it uh, so that now, uh, instead of paying uh, a fixed price, you pay a monthly price. And once you pay, uh, if you pay, and generally the price was between $39 to $79 a month. And if you pay that price, you get access to all Coursera co uh, uh, assignments and grading for that particular specialization. So if you want to sign up for two specialization, you need to sign up separately. Uh, they further clamped down on financial aid. Uh, before financial, they were very liberal with their financial aid applications. I tried it once, and it, I was almost immediately approved. Uh, but after this uh, change, now it takes uh, 15 days to approve a financial aid application. And you also have to write a 300-word essay to actually get uh, before you can apply for financial aid. Uh, this was one of my favorite experiments that Coursera tried. Now what they done, instead of having a separate subscription for each specialization, there was just one price. You pay $49 a month, and you get access to entire Coursera's ca catalogs. Uh, you get access to the entire graded assignments and certificates for the entire catalog. Uh, this meant like the cost of Coursera went down drastically because before you you had to sign up for each subscription separately and pay thirty nine or forty nine fifty nine dollars. Now for forty nine dollars, just one price, you get access to the entire catalog. Uh, they ran this test for a few months, but we don't know why they decided not to move forward with it. And you know, and these. And, you know, the, some of the experiments that hi I just only highlight a few ones, but Coursera constantly innovated or constantly tried to experiment with different monetization model. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, they constantly innovated or experimented with different monetization models, and uh, they came to some answers and. Uh, this was the, the this was the final model they chose, which is basically sub subscription. Uh, you subscribe for each specialization uh, separately, and um, pay a monthly price. And if you stop paying, then you lose access to the paid assignments after you uh, cancel your subscription. So let's look at how different business units inside Coursera are doing. The biggest, uh, the first business unit is the B2C, or uh, business to consumer. It is what you see when you go to Coursera.org. Um, in October, uh, or in 2016, uh, Coursera had 100,000 monthly paid learners, and they were signing up 20,000 new paid learners every month. Uh, I did some back of the envelope calculation and the total revenue from this was around uh, 50 to $60 million in 2016. In 2017, they announced that the number of paid learners has increased by 70%. The second uh, business unit inside Coursera is online degrees. And at this year's Coursera conference, they revealed that uh, they had already made 10 million US dollars in tuition revenues from online degrees. 
Uh, they have over 1,600 uh, students as of January 2018. A majority of them belong to the IMBA. That was the first online degree launched by Coursera with partnership with Illinois. And the final business is a unit is Coursera for business. And it's, one, uh, it's going really fast. It, uh, in March, they had 900, uh, more than 900 customers signed up. Uh, but I would say uh, it's probably more than 1,000 by now. And this is what I meant by the title, the a product at every price. Now MOOC providers like Coursera have a product that goes from free to millions of dollars. So they have free to audit courses, more than 2,700 free to audit courses. They have specializations uh, which cost more than around fifty dollars a month on average. There are more than two fifty specialization. Their online degrees uh, cost around 50, anywhere between fifteen to thirty k, and they have ten such. They have announced ten uh, online degrees. And the corporate training it costs around four hundred dollar users per year. So depending on the size of size of the company and the number of employees, uh, this, this can easily go into tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars. In fact, a multi-year contract can go into millions. So now Coursera, has a, Coursera is targeting different products at different prices. And I summarize this pricing tiers into six different tiers of monetization. Uh, at the heart of this uh, this model, the, it's still the university's courses, uh, but, diff uh, 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 but different services and uh, uh, credentials are tiered on top of it. Uh, each tier of pricing adds some value on the tier below, and the smallest tier, the free tier, the lowest tier, acts as a marketing channel uh, for the tiers above. So let, let me go through each of these tiers. Uh, the tier one is free and free to audit. Uh, and it's currently they have over 10,000 courses uh, in this tier. Um, the next tier is certificates. Uh, by certificates, I mean the single course certificate. Uh, but Generally speaking, nowadays even the content is bundled into the certificate price. So in case of Coursera, if you pay for the specialized certificate, you get access to the graded assignments and homeworks. And this is a dialogue from um, FutureLearn. And the way FutureLearn does it, uh, 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 the way they do it is like, once you sign up for a course, you can access it for free until two weeks after the course end ends, but if you want unlimited access, uh, you need to upgrade. The third tier is uh, micro-credentials, uh, some that you might have heard of is Udacity, Nano Degrees, Coursera, Specialization, edX's, MicroMasters, and I think this is, a, this is one of the most confusing tiers. Each, because of the, uh, there are two reasons why. The first reason is each MOOC provider is trying, trying to create a new name for their credential. And so even some MOOC, MOOC providers have multiple different credentials. And this causes, for a new learner, this causes confusion. Um, it's not easy to understand what does a nano degree mean or what's a micro master mean. Um, and it causes confusion even for employers. And the other source of uh, confusion is the lack of uh, consistency within a credential. Um, as you can see in this, uh, this is an analysis that we published on our blog just uh, yesterday, where we analyzed all the micro-credentials uh, out there. Uh, but you can see there's a big variation in price in effort as well as uh, in the time required to complete uh, on one of these credentials. And I think that creates further confusion um, because people are not sure what, 
or employers rather, I would say, when they're not sure what to expect when they see these, this, these credentials on the resume. I think there's a lot more work needed to be done to somehow standardize these credentials. And the fourth tier, uh, and these, this is the landscape of MOOC-based micro-credentials. Uh, as you can see, some like Coursera and edX have multiple micro-credentials. And there's so far more than 450 micro-credentials uh, that have been launched. The fourth tier is the credit tier. Uh, this is actually the least popular tier. Uh, one of the th first major uh, announcement in this tier was the uh, Arizona State and, um, Univers and edX Global Freshman Academy. Uh, what they did was they uh, released a, a bunch of courses that were targeted at the first year of undergrad that you can take online and earn credit for them thus thereby saving uh, the time you spend on, on campus. Uh, but this is really never took off. Another example is edX's MicroMasters. This is a credential, micro-credential, which has attached credit attached to it. But to actually gain the credit, you need to apply to a, uh, you need to get accepted into a master's program. Each each MicroMaster is roughly around one semester of a master's program. And the goal is to save time and money on campus to the students. But unfortunately, it's only from the universities that create the MicroMasters that are accepting the MicroMasters as a credit. So it's not still, you can't just go to any universities and get credit for it. Uh, Early this year, we made a list of 370 uh, courses which have college credit to attach to it, and you can take for free. Uh, this college credit can be in the form of the ASU's Global Freshman Academy, or they might be part of micro-credentials like MicroMasters, or they, may, they might be part of online degrees. And that brings to my next year, MOOC-based online degrees. Generally, the MOOC-based degrees work as following, like uh, you pay as you go. So you only pay for the courses that you are taking. Uh, it doesn't follow a semester pattern, so they are made to fit more into the learner schedule. And in many cases, they're built on top of uh, free online courses and MOOC-based credentials. For example, the IMBA is, consists of six to eight specializations. And this is, um, these are the numbers from the top three MOOC-based uh, MOOC degrees out there. Um, the George Online Master's in Computer Science from Georgia Tech was the first one. And I think the number of students is now 7,500, around 7,500. Uh, they're graduating a lot of students. Uh, I think 7% of computer science students in America are being graduated from this online degree. Uh, but if you do some back of the envelope calculations, you can see that the total revenue from just three of these degrees, potential revenue rather, is $80 million. Uh, since it's pay as you go, it doesn't mean they made $80 million, but if people, all these people finish to the end, then you'll make $80 million in revenue. And that is one of the reasons why MOOC providers are investing heavily into creating more online degrees. Uh, currently, we have 25 to 30 degrees announced. And I expect in the next few months and years, we'll see a lot more, uh, lot more activity in this space. Uh, I call it the second wave of MOOC hype. And the last year is the corporate training. Um, this is a very lucrative tier. Um, and this is how uh, Coursera's plans look like. Uh, they generally charge $400 per user per employee. 
And uh, the advantage of this tier is uh, corporates already have, usually have a big training budget, and the MOOC providers just want a uh, piece of it. Unlike the original MOOC space, where people were not uh, used to paying for courses, in this case, corporates are used to paying for courses and are uh, pay, used to paying for e-learning and training. So the MOOC providers are trying to get a piece of that. Uh, and, and, and generally, the corporate training tier is very similar to the, uh, the free courses that we can take, or the, it's just that they get also on top of, the, the, they get certification, and on top of that, they also get like some private forums and some tracking and real-time analytics. The last two tiers, the online degree tiers and corporate training tiers, is something that all the MOOC providers are focusing heavily on. And we'll see more uh, investment into those tiers uh, in the future. Um, now let me go through a few examples of uh, monetization. Uh, then it's very difficult to get, find actual numbers, but there are some numbers that I found online I'd like to share it with you. The first one is the IMBA, the University of Illinois and Coursera's um, uh, MBA of completely online MBA degree. This, these numbers are a bit old. Um, I think they're from end of 2017. But, but this shows the perf uh, like how you can, uh, this, this shows the perfect use case for the six tiers of monetization. So from a learner's perspective, either you can take a course for free and 1.2 million have, or you can take a bit more and earn a certificate and 49,000 certificates have been awarded. And if you get a bunch of these certificates together, you get a specialization. And if you pay a bit more, uh, you can get actual college credit. And if you pay a lot, lot more, you get an online degree. So, so you can see how, uh, how the same content is monetized at different prices, and it for someone like a uh, university and someone like Coursera, uh, it creates a good effective monetization model. Even on the certificate tier, if you just do some back of the envelope, it's at least a couple of million dollars in revenue. And, and the degree program is at least $20 million in revenue. So, this, so it creates an efficient monetization channel for both the university as well as for the uh, MOOC provider. So Udacity is another uh, is a MOOC pro, it's a provider that was started by Stanford professor Sebastian Thrun, um, and their approach is usually to partner with industries. They don't nowadays they don't partner with universities. They create they partner with industries to create content uh, which is uh, very employer friendly. Um, they. They have something called, their credential is called nano degree. They have around 22, 23 nano degrees. And currently they have more than uh, 50,000 students enrolled in nano degrees. Their most popular nano degree is called the self-driving car nano degree. And overall they have graduated 27,000 students. And last year they made $70 million in revenue. Um, in 2016, they made $29 million in revenue. So the, by focusing on a credential that's more, and content that is more employer and employee friendly, they have been able to monetize really, really well. The next example is not exactly a MOOC, but it shows a good, uh, good way for uh, universities and industry to partner. Uh, we also saw something similar when uh, from Delft. They are also partnering with uh, in industry. So MIT partnered with Boeing and NASA to create a four-course uh, certificate program. I think it was partially funded by one of these companies. And the cost of each certificate was 2.5, almost 2,500 US dollars. And they had 5,000 students signed up for it. Um, half of those students came directly from Boeing. So, if, so the potential revenue is $12.5 million. 
And uh, this, uh, this platform was actually hosted on Open edX, a white labeled instance of Open edX. Open edX is the same technology that ThaiMOOC is using to, uh, to serve their courses. And the final example is from uh, HarvardX. Uh, uh, this is data is also outdated. Uh, they used to publish a yearly report with these numbers, uh, but they have stopped publishing at least the revenue numbers. But as of June, when of June 2015, Harvard was the biggest uh, was the biggest uh, provider, biggest university on the edX platform. They had two million students enrolled, and they had launched 60 plus courses. But the in the first two and a half to three years of operations, they only made a million dollars in revenue. Um, but if you compare that with the John Hopkins data science specialization, who, which made uh, $1.75 million in just certificate revenue in uh, probably nine months, you can see why MOOC providers have taken the steps of reducing the free tier um, if it's hard for Harvard to monetize, it's even harder for other smaller universities and brands to monetize. Uh, and through all these changes, uh, I think MOOCs have become really big businesses. Uh, they probably, the top MOOC provider, like probably a, they make around quarter of a billion dollars a year. But a lot of this revenue go, goes to the top uh, three to four providers. So. So the money is not distributed, and it just goes to a few of them. And, and sort of that brings to my final point. Um, I'm almost done. Yes, I'm almost done with my presentation. Um, so if you have questions, you can line up on the mics. I think it's there and there. So, so, uh, so this is. So who makes money? Uh, providers. Because they have hundreds of courses, they only need a few of them to actually make money. A few successful ones, and they are able to, like the data science specialization. We saw in uh, William's presentation yesterday, the, uh, there was a long tail. Two or three courses had the majority of the users. Same for universities. If you, if you have uh, create a lot of courses, a few of them will become successful and make up for the cost of all the others. And when I wrote the steps of monetization, these were the four, for the four steps. But this is actually a step zero. And the step zero is that you might have to invest a lot of money to get to a point where you have to monetize. Uh, when I talked about Coursera, even when they were not making money, uh, they had uh, over 100 people employed running all these experiments, burning, you know, burning a lot of cash. They are based in Silicon Valley, which is one of the most expensive places to live in. They had raised $200 million. Uh, they also had an early movers advantage. Uh, same with TU Delft with their solar energy course. They had an early mover advantage. And if you try to launch a MOOC and try to be sustainable now, sustainable now, it might be really, really, it might be difficult. So I, that's why I think it's, MOOCs need to have an on-campus benefit, so you can, and I think Delft is doing that too. And that way you can create a more sustainable uh, way to launch these courses. And as a student who does these MOOCs, I also prefer that because it increases the credibility of the online education if the same material is used by universities to create, uh, to teach their own students. Uh, that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, to make it fair for the Speaker, every speaker, just one question is needed, please.
Michael. Okay. Uh, uh, th thank you so much, Dawa, for very insightful information. May I ask one question in your own opinion? Do you think MOOC is sustainable? I, I'm listening f uh, from speakers. I found that a business model have to happen. Um, MOOC could be a big friend to all of us, but for educational institutions, especially universities, MOOC could be a big threat. In your opinion, since you have done a lot of research on MOOC and uh, business model, do you think um, this could be the end of many universities or not? Thank you. Uh, I mean, I don't really think MOOCs as a replacement for universities. As we've seen, like it's, the target audience is actually different. It's not the normal university students. It's students who are over much older, people like me. Uh, so in fact, you can think of MOOCs as expanding market rather than thinking about it as taking market share away. And that's what I've heard from like the IMBA and other people is like, uh, it's a different it's a different market they're targeting newer students students who can maybe with family with kids who can't be on on campus so in that sense uh it's i don't think if universities end they will die on for different reasons not MOOCs. Uh, but at the same uh, uh, people at the same time learning from home is hard learning is difficult so that creates other challenges and and if you go like most people don't know about MOOCs, and I think marketing is as important as pedagogy. Uh, so if you're able to promote MOOCs uh, and get to the right people and they know it exists and you can do it cheaply, then I think you can create a profitable business, but, um, but it might be difficult. Just, you know, if you tie it into the education system and create laws, that's a different, you can maybe make it sustainable. But just trying to become like a large, provider like a Coursera where people just sign up with a credit card, uh, I think it's tricky because uh, in the last three, four years, there have been no major providers that have been launched. All the MOOC providers that I, you saw on the slides were, they have been launched for a few years. So that's my answer. Yeah. Okay, one more question from. Yes, uh, thank you. All right, I have actually two questions. In the next three to five years, where do you see MOOCs in the less developed countries versus the more developed countries? And somewhat related, where do you see Class Central going in the next three to five years? Oh. Uh, I, I really don't like to talk about future because you're <laughs> usually wrong. Um, I think in the more developed countries, it will be more micro-credentials. Uh, I, I think prices are going up. Uh, so you wouldn't see pro uh, if uh, MOOC providers, if they go into less developed countries, they would try to go through the corporate training. They would so rather go to the companies than go directly to the users because the, I don't think the users can, most users can afford to pay the price they are asking for. And you have, you have seen enough where companies like edX, Coursera, Udacity try, are trying to target, like I've seen it in India, they're trying to target the IT in companies to pay for these programs. Um, but I see in the less developed countries, the government plays a bigger role. Uh, I heard in, about Malaysia, even Thailand, and even India, where they are trying to create laws and legislation where uh, integrate the the course uh, integrate MOOCs into the education system, I think. So they, I feel like they have more potential there uh, in, um, in developed countries, and at least in US, it, it's, it's all happening on its own. So it becomes difficult to integrate part of, become part of the actual education system. And that's why they want to target more professional learners or more uh, corporations, online degrees. So they're all trying to focus on things that are more expensive. And for Class Central, um, I mean, we hopefully, I don't know, uh, we just keep track of the MOOC space and we, we try to build a better ecosystem around uh, MOOCs and make a better, make people understand what they are. And 
it's it's difficult for me to even now to tell which of what does the MOOC mean. So and it's even difficult with we want to make sense of all these micro credentials, all the new trends, and we want to probably create a vocabulary that some everybody understands and easier to explain instead of micromasters, nano degrees, and all these are complicated terms and every learner can't understand what each one is. We want to create some sort of vocabulary around how do you communicate the level of the course, how do you communicate, how much effort is required, trying to standardize this across all online education resources, not just MOOCs, and I think that's something we want to try in the next few years. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.